Um, I think, I think maybe, yeah, 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 maybe, maybe, uh, I, I, yeah, 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 maybe I, I left out the beta um, in here. So this is this normal. Okay. So in fact, uh, here, here you should put the beta, and maybe, maybe like that, or. Uh, and this should be multiplied by the variance, which is beta 2 over beta. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just because I, I ignored the variance of the normal. Okay, any, any, any other question? Okay, um, so so let me you know I promised you a proof, so uh, I give you I gave you an upper bound, so I still owe you something. And since it's the la you know it's sort of towards the end of the lectures, I'm going to be uh, brave and use some more significant, more serious tools than we did before. Um, And the tool for the lower bound is called a, is called a Riccati transform. Okay, so, so this uh, Riccati transform is, is the, um, the word, word in this, in this uh, world of Schrodinger operators for taking the log derivative. Okay. So it just shows that no matter what great things uh, you did in your life, they may just end up naming the log derivative after you. Uh, you know, in other, way, other places it's called the Hopf-Kolf transform and there are various names. <coughs> but, <laughs> you know, if you have, right, so, so if you have this, this differential equation, right, that f, so, so, so what is the eigenvalue equation, right? So, so you have something like uh, an operator, which is, minus del xx plus some potential, okay? We write it like this, we depending on x. This is, this is a, your Schrodinger operator. The eigenvalue equation for, for this is, is, right, it's just that lambda f is equal to uh, minus del xx vx times f. So this is a second uh, order linear differential equation. And this is a way to try to understand the uh, roots. If, if, if this is satisfied for f, and, and um, also the boundary condition that satisfies for f, then, then um, f is an eigenfunction with that eigenvalue lambda. So, of course, one thing you can try, uh, even though I have zero chance, is just to pick a lambda and try solving for f, right? The, the left boundary condition is given to you, so, so there's, you don't have a choice there. But the right boundary condition, which essentially just means that f doesn't blow up, or f stays in L2, may or may not be satisfied. Okay, so pretty much all the time it won't be satisfied. Nevertheless, you can still get information out of solving this equation for a given fixed lambda. Okay, and, 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 and I'll tell you what that information is, and this is what the Riccati transform is for. So, so if you take p to be f prime over f, okay, then you get the first order differential equation, which looks like this. So p prime is uh, x minus lambda minus, oh, sorry, vx here. Okay. So vx minus lambda. Um, minus p squared, so this is the term that you get from doing this, this change, uh, and that's it. Okay, so, so vx is going to be our potential, which for us it's like x plus this derivative of white noise, or the Abranian motion. So, um, So, so, um, 
yeah, so, so you can solve this equation instead of that. Okay? And here is what the information that you get. Okay? So, so here is the, the, the following fact, which is true in general for, for Schrodinger operators. And if I have time in the end, I'll maybe explain it to you. But for now, I'm just going to state it as a fact, because it's, it's, it's subtle. So, so you have lambda, lambda, one, lambda 1 is less than or equal to lambda. Sorry, lambda is less than or equal to lambda 1. So, so again, I'm picking a lambda, and I'm solving this equation. Okay? Uh, this happens if and only if, uh, maybe less than lambda 1, like this, if and only if. The solution does not blow up. Okay, and I'll I'll tell you I'll tell you how what this means and and how. Okay, so I sol solve it. There is no, there is this p squared term. So actually, this p squared term in a differential equation can be bad, right? It can pull you down very fast. Uh, so, so you see, now this is perfect for pale tail the bounds, right? So we want to see the probability that, that this is less than or equal to that. So just, I, just, I can just solve it for a fixed lambda, and I get, uh, I get bounds for the probability of lambda 1 being less than that fixed lambda. Okay? Um, so let's see, how, what is the picture? Okay, what is the picture for this p? Um, so, so here, so let's look at this function, right? So, for us, the vx is x plus uh, plus, plus this Brownian motion, right? Uh, with some variance prime. So let's forget about the Brownian motion for now, okay? And let's uh, let's just look at the area operator. So, what is the how does the drift term look like? So, so let's say where it is zero. Where it is zero is where x equals p squared, right? So that's a parabola. So there is x, and here is uh, p prime. Right? So there's a parabola where this is zero. Okay. And uh, and here, everywhere else outside the parabola, parabola the drift is drown, down. So when you solve this differential equation, you think of some particle moving in this drift field, uh, it will try to go down. <coughs> and, uh, and again, so here it, it's going down. And here this is, in the middle, it's, it's going up. The y-axis is is the drift, so it's p prime. It's the y-axis is j so uh, what am I? S the y-axis is p. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Okay, and uh, that's p, and I'm drawing the drift. Okay, as in, in in this sense. Okay. So it's a. It's, this is really a three-dimensional plot. What I'm doing. Sorry, should be a z-axis, and those are represented by the arrows. Okay, so I'm just drawing this differential equation. So, so what's going to happen? Okay, so let's see, for example, the airy case. Okay, so let's uh, let's say that I do this at zero. Okay, what is it going? What's going to happen? So, so I'm gonna, I have to start at infinity because I start with f prime over f, and f starts at zero. Okay, so this one actually has to start at infinity. That's some technical thing. It's not so hard to figure out what that means because the p prime p squared really pulls it down very fast. So, you, so you, your particle will come here. And then it will get into this, this valley, okay, and, and then it won't blow up. Okay? So that means that that means that uh, that the uh, top eigenvalue, the, the, the first eigenvalue is greater than zero, which is true. Okay? So now the other thing we should notice that is that this translation invariance we still have here. So so I should draw a different field in general for every every lambda, but, but here, the potential is just, you can just put, put this into x. So instead of changing lambda to be something larger, I could just look at the same picture and start it earlier. Okay, okay so, so I could start, say, from here, and you know, if, I, if I start it early enough, 
then what the solution will just come down and blow down like this, and it will tell you that, you know, that this value, uh, and the negative of this value, so this minus lambda one, minus lambda, here, uh, is uh, is actually an upper bound for the top eigenvalue, for the bottom eigenvalue of the of the array operator. Okay. So so now uh, so this is the picture, but 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 now let's put in this b b prime, right? So when we put in the b prime and solve this ODE, right? This becomes an SD, stochastic differential equation. So what I drew there is the drift of the stochastic differential equation, and what I didn't draw is, is, is of course, it has some, some noise term. So you have, uh, you know, this is, this is really nice. It's literally like a story, right? You have this particle that moves in this field, and you're rooting for it to blow up or not to blow up. And you want to see what is the probability of those things happening. Um, so, so, you know, what could happen? Well, any, everything that I've drawn here can happen, except there is also some randomness, right? So it's possible that this particle will start here, you know, and it wiggles, and it wiggles, and it wiggles, and, and instead of staying in this, this groove here, it actually fights itself through. This drift gets to here, and then it blows down. So that kind of thing can happen. So it has some probability, and actually you can estimate it. Okay. So let's let's uh, let's actually do the computation now. Okay. So so here's what I have to do. Okay. It's, uh, uh, to 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 have this bound that I had up there. So what I have to do is I have to give a lower bound on the probability of the following. I have I start at minus a. Okay. Uh, and I have my stochastic particle. Okay, and I have to make sure that it doesn't blow down. Okay, so what I hoped for it to do is to come here and then, and then and, and, and end up in this grove. Okay, so so let me <coughs> write it like this. So 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 the probability that. Uh, lambda 1 is greater than a, okay, is actually equal to a probability. And let me put in here some starting points. So I start at minus a in time and, uh, and plus infinity in space. And p is my particle. Um, and this is that it doesn't, does not blow up, okay. This is actually an equality. This is no. There's no inequality yet. Um, now, of course, blow up. So again, two things can happen to this particle if you look at this picture. One is what I've drawn. It comes down and it hangs around for a while and it ends up sticking in this grove. Okay. The other thing that it can go is that it goes to minus infinity. That's what I call blow up. Uh, okay, so now notice that there is some some monotonicity here, right? So if particles start below another particle, then you can then you always they'll keep this kind of order. Um, so 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 I can again I need uh, a lower band for his. So let me let me put this lower band. So this is of course greater than or equal to the probability of starting with at minus a and instead of infinity one of the same thing. Okay, because it's it's easier for for this particle that starts below to blow up. <coughs> and then I'm gonna try to describe a particular scenario for this to happen. Okay. And it turns out that this scenario is gonna be good enough so that it will match our upper bound. And the scenario is this. I'm just gonna have this. Uh, have this. Uh, I'm gonna look at this uh, strip here from two to zero. So I'm gonna start my particle at at one, and I want the want it to stay in here. Okay. So that's one particular way to go. And then after after I want it to after I, it stays in here until zero, I ask it to to do this particular one. 
Okay, so, so let's write it like this. So it's the probability that P stays, again, it's starting from minus A and 1, that P stays in 0, 2 uh, until time 0. Okay. And then after I, 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 uh, I got to here, I, I want this not to blow up. Okay, that's all I want. Now, of course, that depends on where I ended up. But if I stay in, 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 in 0 to 2, then I certainly did end up above 0. And, and of course, the easiest to blow up is when you start at 0. So if I want just an inequality, uh, I, 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 the following inequality is correct. I can write it as a product. So probability of, of 0, 0 starting from 0, 0, that P doesn't blow up. OK? So notice that this doesn't have A in it anymore. This is just some constant. So we can basically forget about it. OK? So we're just, so we're just, uh, oh, I forgot to close this thing. Um, so we're just going to compute that last, last term. Um, OK. And here, here comes uh, the part that I feel a little bit guilty about. But maybe you won't kill me, which is that we're going to compute that using Gersonov's formula. Okay. So what's Gersonov's formula? Uh, P is some funny diffusion with various drifts. And we know that these things are absolutely continuous with respect to ordinary Brownian motion. Uh, but there is some density. And then when you want to compute probabilities, uh, you can, for P, you can also compute those probabilities as an expectation of this density uh, over the event that you're interested in. So, so here is uh, what this gives us. So this is equal to the expectation. And I'm going to give you just the answers here to 0, x minus b squared. Now this is ordinary Brownian motion, dB, plus or minus beta over 8 of x minus b squared squared dx. OK? And uh, oh, I forgot to put an exponential. So yeah, this is a, this, this this always comes in this exponential form. This is just the density what I'm writing. Okay, density of the two processes. And this thing has to be on an event, uh, which is what I want. So that b is in zero two. Mm. Okay. Uh, for 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 time, uh, b t, or b x x is time, for x in minus a to zero. Okay. So this again is uh, this this thing is equal to that. Okay. So what am I doing? I want Brownian motion to start here. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So at minus say one. I want it to stay in this, in this interval and integrating uh, this number over there. So, okay, so as it turns out, uh, this, is, this is the nicest one. Okay, so look at this term, because this is what, this is what gives you the answer. So when you look at these terms, imagine that um, b is between 0 and 2. Okay, so this thing you can basically forget about. Right? Because in this event, b is, b is between 0 and 2. So, so you're just integrating x squared from, from minus a to 0. OK, so what do you get here? So these terms give you minus beta over 24, one third coming from the integral of x squared of a cubed. OK? So that's what we were, that's what we were after. 
this density term. And the other term is a dB term. Uh, you, you, you can show by integration by parts that it's, this is actually big O of A. So it's, it's, it's really, that doesn't really contribute to the main leading, leading asymptotics. And then <laughs> you also have to check the probability that B is in this interval for, for that short time, but for that time from A to zero, but that's just exponential in A, right? Any Markov chain staying in some, some reasonable set for a time is just exponential in a time. So. Okay, so, so that's again unimportant. <laughs> so, so that's the end. Okay. Um, so I hope, I hope this was somewhat useful. Uh, I've shown you how to think about random matrices in terms of random operators, right? By uh, actually keeping the structure of the operator and using that to deduce questions that you're interested in, even in the limit, right? And, and, and they have seen, I think, three or four kinds of operator limits of matrices, and all of them gave us some theorems about, about uh, laws of eigenvalues and other things. Uh, and as you know, this area is, is, is huge, so there is a lot to do. Uh, you have seen Elliot's talk, where uh, trying to understand how these tridiagonal operators move under, under Dyson's Brandy motion, for example. So that's, they have some nice progress, but there is still a whole lot to do in, the in that area. And there are many, many open questions, including analyticity of beta and of, of various statistics that are, that are not known. Um, so maybe I'll stop now, and if you have any questions, uh, yeah, let me know. More questions? Uh, yes, absolutely. So, so there is a very nice paper of, of uh, Brian Ryder and Michel Ledoux, where they where they do exactly use exactly these techniques to to give uh, large deviation bounds for for matrices, finite matrices. Yeah, uh, you know, it's not they do almost the same as what we do. It's just, it's just harder to do with the finite process. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, I guess maybe the precise term is intermediate deviations, so, yeah. Ah, yeah, thank you for that question. <laughs> so, so, yes, uh, that's another thing. This is also a nice way to deduce the tracy widom formula, which is the Penlevé formula. Because when you write, you know, you look at this, uh, equality, P doesn't blow up, right? P is uh, an SDE. And when you have an SDE, uh, the probability of some SDE is not blowing up, is actually you know, expressed as a solution of some PDE. This is always the case. So you can write the PDE for the tracy widom formula, okay, using this. And uh, with some extra work, uh, the key is that that the values of that PD are not always meaningful because you don't really know what it means when you start your... your um, you see, uh, these things have, have meaning, right? This is Tracy with on tails, but only when you have plus infinity. So the difficulty is that you don't have an interpretation a priori of what it means when you put here a different number. Okay? But you can write a PD for this P where A and this, this thing varies. So to that comes this, uh, to the rescue comes the theory of rank one perturbation. This is done in a paper with, in the thesis of Alex Blumendahl, my, my Furman student, which is that it turns out that if you do rank one perturbations of these beta ensembles, then, and, and you push it through this limit, they just become boundary conditions. So for, for the rank one perturb Tracy Widom laws, uh, you have the same thing except you put here some W, okay? So now I have an interpretation of, of that number for every A and every W. And I also have formulas for that number using, using Penlevé equations. And you can actually just plug in those formulas and check that they satisfy the PDEs. 
And uh, it's easy to check that the PDs have a unique solution. So, so that way you prove the traceability laws. It, it, it gives you pen levé directly without uh, free home determinants. Yes? Uh, yes, so that's a good question. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't know a good answer to that. Um, probably for two you could work something out, but if you want for a thousand it would be, it would be um, maybe possible, but you'd have to give up some precision or something. Do you know what the optimizing functions look like? Uh, well, if, if you go among... Uh, well, so... So the optimizing functions are the eigenfunctions, right? Uh, and, and, I d and I do have some idea of what they look like. They're similar to the, to the ARI functions, right? To the ARI eigenfunctions. Um, am I talking about? No, the optimizing functions are the eigenfunctions under this, under this strange large deviations, yeah, sorry. So they're not similar to the ARI because they, this is large deviation uh, regime. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, well, you know, they... they yeah, so, so the answer to this is, 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 is we haven't looked at it, whether, whether we know, right? So we, you, you expect it to be close to what we guessed for optimizing functions, but, but I don't know how close. I think you could probably get something out of it by, by uh, if you study this diffusion, then you can study this much more precisely, and, and there are various papers of studying these things more precisely and, and getting further terms in this expansion of the, of the tail. And, and from those papers, you could probably, if you wanted to, get information about the optimizing functions. Yes. More questions? If not, uh, let us thank again Berlin for this for this lecture. <laughs>